Hello, everybody, and welcome to this evening's launch of the uh, the Communist Women's Movement 1920 to 1922 Proceedings, Resolutions and Reports. I'd like you to welcome you to this important event and to the speakers who will be taking part. The This online event will discuss the recently published documentary collection on the communist women's movement of the period 1920 to 1922. The event will bring together the co-editors of the volume, Mike Tabor and Daria Duakovina, and also two others who we've here in the audience, or sorry, in our on our panel, Judy Cox and Brigitte Studer. Um, the communist women's movement was virtually unknown until very recently, but it's important that we know that it was the first truly international revolutionary organization of women. It was formed in 1920 and it mapped out a program for women's emancipation, both in Russia and internationally, and worked to advance women's position within the communist movement. The present volume is part of a series on the Communist International in Lenin's time, and it contains proceedings and resolutions of the Communist Women's Movement Conferences, along with reports on its work on the, all around the world. And most of the contents of this book are actually in English for the very first time, with almost half of it appearing for the very first time in any language. I apologise because I have failed to introduce myself. My name is Anne McShane. I'm a Marxist. I'm a human rights lawyer based here in Ireland, in the south of Ireland, in Cork. I completed a PhD on the Genotiel, the women's department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 19, sorry, in 2019. And I have been involved working uh, with Mike and Daria also in relation to projects connected with this. So tonight's speakers will be as follows. The person to kick off will be Daria, who is a co-editor of this book. She is a history researcher who teaches at the International Institute in Geneva. She has worked on the Communist International and she has, and she's been recently awarded a PhD at the University of Montreal for the research of the international ties of Canadian communist youth during the interwar years. Then we will have Mike Tabor, who is the other editor, and he is also an editor of numerous books on revolutionary and working class history. His most recent book is Reform, Revolution and Opportunism, Debates in the Second International, 1900 to 1910. Then we will have Brigitte Studer, who's, the, who's a professor emirata of contemporary history at the University of Bonn. In her research, she focuses on gender history and on a social historical approach of political history. She has published she has published widely on the history of international communism and the, on the history of feminism and women's work. And most recently, her book Travelers of the World Revolution, a global history of the communist international was published in 2023. Last but not least, we will have Judy Cox, who is a retired primary school teacher and a socialist activist living in Britain. She has an MA in Victorian Studies and has recently been awarded a PhD at Leeds University for her research into the role played by women in the British radical movements of the 19th century with a focus on Chartism. She is author of The Women's Revolution, Russia, 1905 to 1917, along with numerous other books and articles. So, we have a very interesting lineup of speakers here tonight to discuss this uh, important work that's been published. And I would like to begin, therefore, by asking Daria to give her presentation. Thank you. Uh, so hello, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good, no good morning, depending on where you are. 
Uh, I'm very thankful to Haymarket and Historical Materialism for organizing this book launch, uh, to Anne uh, for moderating this, to my co-panelist and co-editor uh, for being here, and of course to all those who contributed, those many people who contributed to this book project. Uh, so I have roughly 15 minutes to speak, so I will use those 15 minutes uh, to speak about the creation of the Communist Women's Movement, its program and activities in the early 20s, very briefly, and based on the material published in the book. So uh, this will hopefully um, allow the readers to have a glimpse of the rich documentary material that the book contains. Uh, and then uh, Mike, I believe, will speak more about the book as part of the commentary and publishing project uh, and the relevance uh, of its agenda and activities uh, for today's uh, women's struggles. Uh, so uh, let me start uh, speaking about uh, the Communist Women's Movement's major ideas, structures, and campaigns. So I guess, as many of you know, um, in March 1919, uh, the Communist International, also known as the Comintern, was founded, and the Communist Women's Movement was founded uh, just a little bit more than one year later, in the summer of 1920. Uh, actually, the name itself, the Communist Women's Movement, was not an official name, but that's how uh, communist women um, used to speak about themselves. The Cominterns and the Communist Women's Movement's uh, program for women's emancipation was very progressive for its time. It linked emancipation of women to the transformation, to the revolutionary transformation of societies and the socialist projects, uh, and it called for total equality of men and women in law and practice, full integration of women into political, economic, and social life, social measures to use the burden of um, housework and child care for women, free education and medical care for women, and social aid for pregnant women and mothers. Uh, so before I speak more about the movement itself, uh, let me say a few words about what has been written about it uh, in scholarly and other literature. Um, so, although a rich body of literature has studied women, gender, and communism, uh, the works on the communist women's movement in an international or transnational perspective uh, still remain limited. Scholars of Soviet history have made important contributions on the work of the Women's Department of the Communist Party, the Genodzel, uh, including uh, Anne's work as well, uh, and there is work on uh, outstanding women's leaders, Soviet women's leaders. A few works have discussed interwar communist women's efforts in separate countries, mostly in Europe. Few contributions have engaged with the history of the movement in a transnational perspective. And at the same time, uh, many authoritative uh, Western scholars have tended to dismiss communist party aligned and affiliated women's organizations and communist and especially Soviet policies towards women. Uh, the same dismissive as attitude is largely present in scholarly contributions on socialist and communist women's rights activism. Liberal feminists of Cold War era and some more recent commentators have highlighted um, that communist and socialist women's movement uh, mobilized their memberships primarily to serve party goals rather than mobilize the party to serve women. Uh, some socialist feminists have in their turn criticized Marxism's inability to sufficiently analyze the centrality of the gender division of labor in all spheres, including crucially the family and the lack of concern with sexuality and reproduction issues or violence against women. That said, uh, the communist women's movement remains largely unknown. It is 
moreover, usually excluded from the traditional scholarly narrative of the waves of feminism. So this book, I believe, seeks to give the readers a first-hand experience with the ideas, debates, work, and activities of this movement. And in this sense, it also gives a better idea and understanding of what the struggle of women's emancipation was in the 20th century, challenging the still persisting vision of feminism as a movement led by upper and middle class, liberal and predominantly Western women. Now, going back to the movement itself, how did it function? So the movement, um, was organized around the International Women's Secretariat, founded in November 1920, uh, which was first in, in Moscow and then moved to Berlin. Uh, it is important to say that uh, in the early 20s, the movement was uh, rather independent from the Comintern. Uh, the delegates would meet at annual conferences in Moscow to discuss uh, general strategy, but uh, more uh, tactical uh, and frequent biannual meetings of the so-called women's correspondence uh, would be uh, organized in Berlin, and that's where women from different countries would discuss their experience in their specific uh, countries. The Communist Women's Movement also created uh, a women's secretariat for the Near East to coordinate work in West Asia and Turkey. And finally, uh, another way for communist women to be in touch and to, to learn about what was going on in other places uh, was uh, their monthly international magazine, Die Kommunistische Frauen Internationale, the Communist Women's International, published until 1925. Um, the movement engaged in internationally coordinated campaigns. In the 20s, this were the revival of the International Women's Day, campaign for equal pay for equal work and against discriminatory layoffs, uh, something which we would call affirmative action today, that is the promotion of women to leadership positions in communist parties and trade unions, transformation of housework into social industry through the creation of public canteens, laundries, childcare facilities, etc. Uh, relief to Soviet Russia, ruined by World War I and Civil War. Uh, communist women also engaged in anti-colonial and anti-imperialist fight and fought for reproductive rights, and for, but also for social measures for mothers. So now let me briefly describe uh, the contents of the book. So the central pieces of the book are the proceedings of the first uh, conferences of communist women held in uh, 1920 and 1921. Uh, the first conference was rather small. It was actually the founding conference held in the summer 1920. Uh, it brought together um, just a little bit more than 50 uh, delegates uh, from uh, 19 countries. And all those uh, delegates uh, presented their uh, reports on activities in their countries. But most importantly, this first conference uh, has set up a commission to write guidelines for the communist women's movement, which Clara Zetkin has drafted. The guidelines laid out uh, general principles, uh, such as linking the oppression of women to the existence of the capitalist system and the necessity for women to join the revolutionary struggle to obtain true emancipation. Uh, but it also defined uh, the demands that I mentioned earlier, such as equal rights, full equality in political, social, and economic spheres, uh, including voting rights, access to education, medical care, et cetera, et cetera. The guidelines also defined uh, the more specific tasks uh, for the communist women's movement for socialist, capitalist, and pre-capitalist countries. 
Now, let me say a few words about the second conference uh, held in uh, the summer of 21. Um, so basically, the proceedings uh, of this conference contained in the book come from the Comintern archives in Moscow, and this material has never been published before. The second conference was very interesting. It was very lively and featured debates on a number of questions of principle. Uh, one of those debates was between the adherents and opponents of the revolutionary offensive theory. And this debate was also linked to the debate on parliamentarism and the participation in election, as well as collaboration with non-proletarian women's rights fighters including bourgeois feminists. Uh, yet again, this debate was linked to um, the debate of how to deal with non-proletarian women, right? How to include them into the communist women, um, such as intelligentsia, peasant women, housewives. And although uh, the conference featured passionate debates and uh, discussions were full of emotion, the, the delegates uh, mentioned to harmonize their opinions and differences and work out a coherent plan of action and passed a number of important resolutions. Uh, one of them insisted on the importance of establishing women's sections where they did not yet exist. Uh, the resolution encouraged the parties to support women uh, in all possible ways uh, in this, uh, but also to give them an um, important amount of autonomy in methods of work. Um, another important resolution insisted on the importance of reaching out to broad non-communist masses of women. And uh, yet another one, um, created the correspondence con uh, conferences that I mentioned before uh, for communist women from different parts of the world to exchange their experience. Uh, these conferences were to be held every six months in Berlin. And the book has reports of two of such conferences held in January and October 22. These reports uh, reports come from the um, Kommunistische Frauen Internationale. Uh, so the first conference uh, brought together delegates from Russia, Germany, Great Britain, France, Sweden, Romania, Switzerland, Denmark, uh, and more countries uh, whose delegates couldn't travel sent in their reports. The important discussions and resolutions of this conference uh, of this conference uh, were the relief to Soviet Russia and the International uh, Women's Day. And a specific date, the, the one which we have today, the 8th of March, was fixed to uh, celebrate this holiday. Uh, the second conference was even more representative with delegates from all European countries where communist parties could work legally, as well as from, uh, except uh, Great Britain, uh, as well as from near and far east. The book also contains another interesting uh, material on another interesting conference. It's a report on the conference um, held in Tiflis, today's Tbilisi, in December 21. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the communist women's movement established in 21 the Women's Secretariat for the Near East. Um, and this conference in Tbilisi um, had delegates from Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Kabardia, the Mountain Republic, Dagestan, as well as Turkey and Iran. And it was basically convened uh, to uh, discuss work among what was termed the women of the East and the necessity to use specific methods uh, to approach uh, these women. Um, the communist women's policy on the women of the East was uh, quite interesting and characterized by 
flexibility and sensitivity towards the conditions of life and cultural contexts that women in the East had to face. Um, Communist women were aware that to determine what forms and methods of work were best adapted to conditions of life of Western women, it was necessary to thoroughly study the position of these women in society, but also to consult these women themselves and to rely on uh, grassroots initiatives uh, of Eastern women. And, but the Fleece Conference uh, also discussed some specific methods of work in the regions of the Near East. Uh, the tasks that were discussed included drawing together peasant women and housewives in household cooperatives where women would be instructed in advanced production methods and uh, be enlisted in the modern economy. Uh, and here, uh, the communist women's movement was very much inspired by uh, the policies and uh, work of the Genodel uh, in eastern regions uh, of Soviet Russia, specifically in the Caucasus um, and uh, Soviet Central Asia. All right, I will just say a few words about the last section of the book, and I will stop here because I think my time is up and I want other speakers to give uh, I want to give time to other speakers. Uh, so the uh, closing section of the book is uh, called Communist Women's Movement Around the World. And it contains reports coming from um, different countries for uh, 21 and 22. And these countries are uh, Germany, France, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Soviet Russia, and Dutch East Indies. All right, I will stop here and I'm looking forward to listening to the other speakers and continuing this discussion further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daria. That was excellent. Mike, would you like to take up the thread now, please? Thank you. Uh, well, first, a thank you to the uh, Historical Materialism book series and Haymarket Books for publishing the volume we're discussing today, as well as for sponsoring this event. And also to my fellow panelists and our moderator, each of whom has made important contributions on the subject. The Communist Women's Movement, founded over a century ago, was a unique organization that's virtually unknown today. But it deserves to be recognized as both a pioneering movement for women's rights, as well as a key component of the Communist International in its early years. The book that Daria and I have put together is part of a four decade long series on the Communist International under Lenin, a series edited and led for most of this time by John Riddell. The Comintern Publishing Project has as its purpose to present this historic revolutionary movement in its own words. Nine volumes in the series have already appeared with several more in preparation. What comes through clearly in all these volumes is that the Communist International in its early years was not a one-dimensional figure or a monolithic block. Rather, it was a living and dynamic mass movement embracing millions in all parts of the world with differing perspectives on many subjects and multiple points of view. Having worked on the Common Turn Publishing Project since its beginning in 1983, I can state that the present volume on the communist women's movement is one of the most intriguing and inspiring. As Daria said, the book includes among its contents the proceedings and resolutions of its first two international conferences in 1920 and 1921. Both of these appear in English here for the first time. The first one was published in Russian at the time uh, and is translated uh, for our volume. The proceedings of the second uh, CWM conference were never published in any language up until now. Perhaps in the discussion, we can speculate why that is. I know I have my own theory. The text was obtained by Daria from the Comintern archives in Moscow uh, in, in German, Russian, and in English. The volume also includes reports and resolutions from other uh, CWN conferences and meetings as Daria mentioned. And one of the most interesting sections 
uh, as she as she spoke about was the one dealing with the communist women's movement around the world, which I, I think ever, I think readers will find very interesting. All told, some ninety percent of the book appears in English for the first time, and the longest single item, which is the second uh, conference proceedings, uh, is published for the first time in any language. Uh, what do we learn from these contents about the communist women's movement? I'll touch on a few things Daria has already talked about. On the local and ground level, the, the, the CWM consisted of women's agitation commissions or departments, then the communist parties of each country. These were not projected as totally independent bodies, separate and apart from the party, but were meant to be vehicles to advance this area of work in recognition of its special needs and requirements. Uh, it, although at the, at the same time, there was quite a bit of independent initiative and autonomy by all the uh, CWM units. These were not what we know of now as women's caucuses. In fact, men could also be part of them. Although, to be honest, very few male communists were particularly interested in doing so. In fact, I'm not actually aware of a single case, although there must have been a few somewhere. On an international level, the CWM had a leadership team, the International Women's Secretariat, composed of outstanding world-class leaders. People like Clara Zetkin, Alexandra Kolontai, Inessa Armand, and many extremely capable secondary leaders. Likewise, on a national level, all these leaders and activists, largely unknown today, deserve to be brought out of obscurity and recognized. What exactly did the communist women's movement do? The book shows the many sides to its work and the tasks it set for itself. The communist women's movement provided a vehicle for mutual collaboration by female communists around the world with regular exchanges of experiences. As Daria mentioned, it produced an international journal, Die Kommunistische Frauen International, edited by Clara Zetkin in Germany. Uh, it's worth it's worth stating that this was one of perhaps the most well written, lively, and independent minded publication in the entire world communist movement at the time. And CWM units in different countries also had their own newspapers or publications. The CWM sought to drive forward the appreciation by the entire communist movement of the importance of the fight for women's emancipation as well as to advance women's participation as both members and leaders of communist parties. It promoted the perspectives, as Daria said, of what could be called affirmative action to develop women's leadership abilities and, and self-confidence. And the, the CWM organized special education and training programs for this purpose. It was also an action organization it initiated important internationally coordinated campaigns, such as raising relief for the victims of the famine in Soviet Russia during the early 20s, as well as reviving International Women's Day as a vehicle for mobilizing working women around the world. And of particular interest for supporters of women's rights today, in many countries, the CWM also initiated struggles and campaigns on issues such as abortion rights, child care, equal pay for equal work, against discriminatory layoffs, and for women's suffrage. Now, the work of the communist women's movement did not come easily or without resistance. Within communist parties, women had to fight prevailing backward views of men regarding women's role and place. These sexist attitudes were prevalent not just among the ranks of male communists, but within the leaderships too. The CWM conferences are full of references to such attitudes within the movement, uh, which you'll be able to read. But despite this resistance, the communist women's movement received strong support from the central leaders of the Communist International, Lenin, Trotsky, Zinoviev, Bukharin, and others. And the CWM didn't just complain about male chauvinism or gripe about all the obstacles they faced. It worked to overcome these problems, and it made substantial progress on all fronts. And readers can actually see some of this prog progress unfold before their eyes. I won't go into the subsequent degeneration of the communist women, women's movement that set in following 1923, leading to its ultimate disappearance, 
except to point out that it paralleled the degeneration of the communist international as a whole under Stalin. This brings me back to the question of the common turn. In contrast to the prevailing view in many circles today, that the Communist International was marked from the beginning by Moscow domination. This book pa paints a different picture. A large number of the major initiatives came from parties other than the Russian CP, which itself was not above criticism. No one waited to hear what Moscow had to say before expressing their opinion, and no one seemed at all reticent about challenging the Comintern leadership. Moreover, all views received a respectful hearing. The book also tells us about another aspect of the common turn, its auxiliary organizations. A number of such for formations were established during the common turn's first five years. The Red International of Labor Unions, the Communist Youth International, Communist Women's Movement, Red Aid, Red Sports, Peasants International, and many others. Inasmuch as the early common turn represented a broad mass movement with millions of members and supporters around the world, each of these organizations had its own distinct features and deserves a separate study. One can't fully appreciate the Communist International without studying its, these auxiliary organizations. This is something that uh, our panelist Brigitte Studer has written extensively about. And of all the auxiliary organizations, the Communist Women's Movement in its early years was perhaps the strongest and most vital. It certainly had the liveliest debates, and it unquestionably had the strongest leadership team. So in addition to everything else, this book shows us yet another side of the, of the common turn, which helps enrich, enrich our understanding of its character and dynamics. I'll close by speaking about how this is also a book for activists today. One reason for this is that many of the fights waged by the communist women's movement a century ago are still very much with us. Abortion and reproductive rights, maternal and child care, full and equal political rights in all areas, along with equal pay for equal work, ending sexual harassment and violence, opposing forced gender roles and stereotypes, and so on. But the struggle for women's emancipation is more than just the sum of each of these individual battles. As Zetkin, Kolontai, and others deeply believe, this struggle has a central place in the overall fight for revolutionary change in society as a whole. Along these lines, I believe that the perspective of the communist women's movement in its early years still offers valuable insights. To highlight three of these. First, its perspective on the revolutionary dynamics of the women's emancipation struggle. That is, the struggle of for women's liberation in itself has a deeply revolutionary thrust, and it's inextricably tied to the working class struggle for socialism. Second, it's view that women's oppression is rooted in capitalism and class society. Consequently, women's liberation is ultimately tied to the elimination of this exploitative system. And third, it's view that working class women have the biggest stake in the fight for women's emancipation. At the same time, as Clara Zetkin always stressed, while working class women will be the foundation of the struggle, the oppression of women nevertheless affects women in all social layers to one degree or another. The movement therefore needs to find avenues of approach to all potential allies and seek to involve them in the fight to the extent possible. To end, I hope that this book together with all the other volumes put out by the Common Term Publishing Project can contribute both to deepening our understanding of this historical experience, as well as providing insights for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for your uh, insights into the history. And now I'd like to ask Brigitte to come into the debate and make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And um, thank you to Daria and Mike for this book, which is not really a bedside reading, but it's still, nevertheless, it's really fascinating because I think this edition fills a gap in our historical knowledge about the activity of early communism after 1917. Um, 
there is an important body of literature about the Bolsheviks' women's politics, and Mike's preface and Doria's introduction provide excellent overviews over this. But, but not much was known about how um, these policies were translated onto the international level. That is how the practices and conceptions of um, former left European socialists, and young radicals on the one hand, and the Russian Bolsheviks on the other hand, intermingled and merged. How they structured the organization, how they decided about the program, how they discussed and uh, decided on contentious points. Also, um, we didn't know much uh, about who were the main actors of this communist women's movement and where did they mainly come from? Because unless one could read German um, and does the journal the Kommunistische Frauen Internationale, that's Communist Women's International, there were practically no sources available about the formation of this early radical left women's movement. I would say a women's movement that was at the same time communist and feminist. And I'm using here the contentious term feminism, which needs some clarifying because the historical actors did not use it. On the contrary, communist women distanced themselves from what they called a bourgeois movement. Then feminism in this context cannot be a descriptive term, but it can be used analytically. In my opinion, what these women did and thought about gender equality can be termed, can be termed feminism. It was um, a feminism that did not call itself feminist. Um, so to say, it was a feminism without feminism. There is an important second insight from the book, um, and this insight concerns the importance given to women's emancipation by the communist movement as a whole. Of course, Bolshevism and international communism in this early phase stood in the socialist tradition that there is no socialism without women's emancipation. That is, though women's emancipation is considered as a particular reason, the universal being represented by the working class, it was considered as an indispensable part of the universal emancipation of mankind. As said Slava Yonova Lenina at the Second International Conference, Women's Con Communist Women's Conference in 1921, and here I quote, it is obvious that without a communist women's movement, the victory of the proletariat is out of question, end of quote. But this was not just a rhetorical trope. The communist women's movement was dedicated to creating just the conditions to realize women's essential participation to socialist to a socialist revolution. In the words of Clara Zetkin, because of the burdens women have to carry, um, that's a quote, in the present period of the collapse of capitalism, they will become the shock troops of the revolution in action. That is what Clara Zetkin said. But now this metaphor and also the communist conception of the class struggle implied women were 
indeed indispensable, but they could not act alone. I, I, I continue with a quote from Zara, the, the quote from Zara Clara Zetkin. She said, um, women, will, women will not do it by themselves and apart from the proletarian masses. On the contrary, they must form the shock troops of the revolution who are in touch with exploited and oppressed, regardless of sex. They must lead these masses to a powerful attack on capitalist society. So this was Clara Zetkin. So as the discussions documented in the book make clear, the autonomy of the communist women's movement was only a relative autonomy. The political action and the political program always had to be in line with the Comintern. Nevertheless, and this is the third insight from the book, in this early phase, there existed a real space for real controversies, debates, disagreements. The opinion of the Bolsheviks was not yet sanctified. For example, this is evident in the discussion about the legacy of the Second International. For the Russian delegates, the struggle for women's rights only began with the Third International, while they denied the socialists any achievements. There was some contradiction. The German Rosie Wolfstein and the Austrian Anna Strömer, they said, this is not true. They insisted on historical objectivity in the thesis. And they said, we need to be accurate. So the pluralism that was still prevalent at the time also manifested itself semantically. Some communist parties had fractions instead of cells, others spoke of caucuses and still others organized meeting circles. Pluralism is also apparent in the question if women should be addressed and organized separately from men as the practice of the Russian genotia suggested. The opinions of the delegates here too differed. Wolstein being strongly in favor of it. The Swedish Gerda Linderoth defending women's integration in the general party organizations. The French Lucie Collard seeing specific women's groups as a promising future form of organizing. Now a fourth finding concerns the historical, I think in my view, first institutional dialogue between East and West. The women of the East were considered as the most oppressed of all by an archaic and religious patriarchy. But the Western communist women were also self-critically aware of their cultural bias and their Eurocentrism. And if necessary, there were delegates to remind them, like the Korean Nam Meng Chung, sorry for the pronunciation, to reproach them their inattention or reproach them their ignorance. So said the Armenian Gayan Yosefona Areshian, quote, you know absolutely nothing of the woman of the East. Now, a final point I want to make, um, I want to mention, um, I want to mention about these early debates is the criticism the communist women expressed against their male comrades for their lack of support. The Russian delegate, I think it was Emma Janssen, noted for instance that women were no priority for the party. And she was not the only one. There were many others who criticized the behavior of their male comrades. But I think such criticism is noticeable because of its symbolic significance. Such criticism was different 
from denouncing capitalism or imperialism. It was an internal criticism. It was directed at their own ranks. So to end with this, and there are plenty of new insights in this book. Um, it's amazing how very mature the discussions were, uh, how very self-confident these political women activists were in this early 20th century. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was fantastic. Um, some interesting stuff there you've put forward for our discussion. Um, so, Judy, I'd like to hand it over to you now to make your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mike and Anne and Daria and Bridget and everybody for organising this um, event and for publishing the book. And I think it is fantastic to have a, a meeting where women are centre stage when you're talking about big historical developments, not just a chapter in the book, but are the book. And as any historian of working class women's history knows that finding sources, finding the voices of working class women is really hard to do, that their voices are not recorded, that they don't write letters and autobiographies and so on. So to have a volume in which not just one or two or three, but thousands, hundreds of working class women who were activists get to speak, get to argue, get to make their point, I think is fantastically um, exciting. And we are listening to the voices of women who are not just women, not just working class women, not just revolutionary socialist women, but women at this point in history. Um, and when you introduced it, I thought, yeah, it's just two years so concentrated and yet so many debates and experiences are brought into that time because this is a point where women thought they were on the brink of making a new world where they thought all this change was possible a uh, utopian vision of emancipated humanity was actually within reach now of course by 1921 it's getting a bit more difficult trotsky um, tells the conference um, in, in 1921 that really raising the red flag wasn't enough, that we're beginning to realise that spreading the revolution was going to be quite hard work. But nevertheless, there's this spirit of optimism and of solidarity and of creativity, which I think is very inspiring. And I want to reflect a little bit on why communist women, of which I count myself one, or revolutionary socialist women, are having a bit of a moment because we have uh, Mike and Daria's wonderful volume. We have Kate Wiegand's Red Feminists about American communist women. We've got Kristen Godsey's Red Valkyries. We've got Rosemary Hennessy's In the Company of Radical Women. We've got a Palgrave handbook of communist women around the world. We've got um, Maral Shamsiri, uh, She Who Struggles, Revolutionary Women Who Shaped the World. That's all in the last couple of years, just that I can think of. And I think there are probably technical questions about the collapse of the so-called communist um, state in, in Russia 30 years ago now and the opening up of archives. Daria went, uh, was able to go and find this gold mine of um, political experience. But I think there's something else going on, which is that when women today seek radical change, they are almost led inexorably back to the early communist years. And to explain that, I've, um, some of you will no doubt be familiar with the movement to abolish the uh, penal institutions led by people like Angela Davis and Ruth Gilmore Wilson, who want to abolish the uh, punitive institutions of the state. Where was that actually achieved? In Russia in 1917 and 18. There is uh, volumes coming out now by Emmy O'Brien and Sophie Lewis on the need to abolish the family. Where was that actually achieved? in Russia in 1918 and 1919. And on a more profound level, rather than just the particular campaigns, I think there's a question of how we as socialists and as socialist women respond to catastrophe. Because there are, of course, huge differences between our lives and the lives of the women documented in this volume, the conferences, and so on a hundred years ago, but there are also profound similarities because they were dealing with a world ravaged by war and imperialism. They were dealing with a world in which 
the very means of life were was under threat, in their case, from the destruction of the war, in our case, from war and also from economic um, degradation and destruction. And they lived for a time where civilization, uh, civilized cultured cities in the, in the heart of Europe could be plunged back into barbarism. And I can't help but when I look at Gaza today, think about the Somme in 1916 or think about Ypres and how sophisticated civilized societies can be thrown back into a hideous kind of medieval barbarism. And another factor I think that links us today with these women um, with Alexandra Kollontai, with Inessa Armand, and so on, is the question of the moderate strategies which have failed. Um, and I get this sort of sense of how prophetic the arguments were in the Congresses of 1920 and 1921, where they're discussing the importance of fighting for political equality, but the limitations for women achieving it. This was you know, only a few places that had the vote for women for a few years, and yet they could predict the fact that although communist and revolutionary socialist women should fight for political equality, it would not liberate the majority of women who would be left in economic hardship and poverty. And I think also the question of bourgeois feminism, which Brigitte raised, which on which the communist women were very firm. Um, we, after you know, decades of female faces in high places of Sheryl Sandberg, Hillary Clinton and lean in feminism and so on. Again, they had a very prophetic analysis that yes, sexism can affect all women in society, but the equality of those at the top will not liberate those at the bottom. And I think also we have a, an, a growing sense of how precarious the gains we made are. The idea that we are having to refight the battle for reproductive rights and reproductive justice in America, that Roe versus Wade was overturned, takes us straight back to the debates uh, documented here about the fight for reproductive rights and abortion rights. And as Mike mentioned, we are still fighting for decent childcare, for free healthcare, for decent education, for um, an end to sexual harassment and end to violence and so on. And Clara Zetkin made the point so beautifully that we fight, of course, for political equality, that, but that is also a point of departure between the socialists and the liberals, the moderates, because for us, it's a step on the road to a wider transformation. Yes, a point of departure, and also, she said, a pillar of strength that can help uh, galvanise and coalesce a revolutionary socialist women inside of that movement. And so I think Today, this volume is so relevant because we need that radical politics, that emancipatory politics, that bold, audacious vision of how things can change, both in practice and in theory, because as people have said, uh, Inessa Armand, Clara Zetkin, um, Alexandra Kollontai developed the theory as well as the practical organisations. Um, E.P. Thompson, the great Marxist historian, talked about the need to rescue the marginalised of the past from the condescension of history. And I think this volume does so much to do that, because when I started reading about women in the Russian Revolution, uh, there was the question of bread and herrings, that women will take to the streets to fight because they need bread and herrings to feed their family. They will riot for food. They'll be there, but then they'll just disappear because women are not um, either structurally or socially capable of um, engaging with political organisation and theoretical developments, which this volume completely uh, gives the lie to. And I think it's also, um, it really excited me because we all talk quite rightly about Clara Zetkin, Alexandra Kollontai and Esra Armand. Their writings are beautiful and uh, insightful, but those individuals do the heavy lifting. Those are the people that we know about. But this volume in documenting the speeches made by women really introduce and invites us, I think, to look beyond those famous women and look at the lives and the experience of some of the other women who pop up in the volume. Um, Evelyn Roy um, spoke from Mexico. She criticised, as Brigitte was saying, she raised the question of backwardness. Why do you keep calling the women of the East back? without saying who's to blame for their backwardness, which is Western imperialism. Um, a fascinating woman who was based in Mexico, married to an Indian revolutionary, wrote lots about India, 
Um, so the door is opening to retrieving uh, Zahida Bernasheva uh, features in the volume. She was uh, a leading teacher and a poet whose works were translated from her language, which was she lived in Tartar, she was a Tartar into Russian, and even uh, Marjorie Newbold, who was uh, one of the delegates from Britain, um, who was one of the first to go from Britain to Soviet Russia uh, alongside Sylvia Pankhurst, her friend. So the volume, in a, in a sense, brings some of the incidental characters back into the limelight to enable us to continue that process of retrieving women who've been hidden from history. Um, the successes outlined, um, I think the, the uh, Communist International, the newspaper, the Women's Communist International that people have talked about, was uh, an incredible achievement given levels of literacy and language barriers. And I want to give you one little quote that talks, um, that I think sums it up. This was published in the magazine. Those who reap the crops and bake the bread are hungry. Those who weave and sew cannot clothe their bodies. Those who create the nourishing foundations of all culture waste away, deprived of knowledge and beauty. And I love that quote because I think for many of these of the women in the book, um, it's not just about equal rights and equal pay and abortion rights, fantastically important though those are, it's also about culture. It's about raising women's political and cultural level and their appreciation. And I think um, the slogan of the women's campaign for, uh, against restrictive abortion rights in Germany was our bodies belong to us, which is a pretty good slogan, I would think, uh, even for today, never mind for 1920. So I think, um, as other people have said, the two things I think are so uh, very significant are firstly the question of relating to the women of the East, which seems to me a very pressing question for us today. Um, following on from the Zonotdale, this was not a question of charity. This was a question of solidarity. As Daria said, you know, it's very important for us to decolonialize our history and not just assume it's white European women who led these movements. Um, and Kolontai said, you know, if, if how can British workers win the fight if the British colonies do not rise? How can the French workers win without a revolution in the French colonies? No great imperialist power can be destroyed without proper win, uh, action being taken. Um, and I think that's a, a, an important question. That This wasn't about enlightened women going around enlightening backward women. It was solidarity in the fight against imperialism. And one of the most striking moments in the book for me was um, in the June the 21st Congress, in the evening session, uh, a group of veiled women came into the con Congress and were greeted with applause. And Clara Zetkin made this speech. And I thought, with all the Islamophobia that we get now and have done since the war on terror, intensified by um, what's happening in Gaza, and some of the collapse of some of the left around the world into that Islamophobia, I'm going to give you a little bit of Clara Zetkin's antidote to that. She welcomes the women from the East who are wearing their veils. She says, they have decided to join us in the revolutionary struggle and to go with us along the same road to communism. From wherever we may originate, whatever may be the colour of our skin, our clothing or our conditions of life, we are of the same stock, the same sex. We are, we are yours, sisters from the Far East. Your cause is our cause. Our cause will be yours. We have one cause, one work in common to drive the revolution forward so that communism should be realised. We all have only one mother country, one home, liberating revolutionary communism, welcome our sisters from the East. And I love those expressions of passionate solidarity across um, from women in imperialist countries, in socialist countries and in pre-imperialist um, and capitalist countries. And Arifa Musa, Musa, sorry, Musa Bekova was one of the many women who spoke really movingly in, in the book about how women were throwing off their veils, how women were coming out of their homes and embracing um, socialism. And I think in that sense, the Congress has gave women from the East a voice and a platform to criticize, to debate and to argue on equal terms. And just finally, the second point is the question of the family. Um, a century of debate about how to replace the family. The Bolsheviks did it and they argued as to how it should be um, emulated 
how resources could be put into creating canteens and nurseries and creches. And uh, Clavidia Nikolova talked about the old cooking pot and how that was now obsolete, the, uh, you know, the symbol of the old society and that women could move forward into a different world. So just to fi finish off in one minute, um, I welcome this volume so uh, gratefully because it opens up these voices and it opens up these perspectives to us. It uh, undermines, I think, the myth that um, women uh, need, uh, that socialism isn't enough, that we need feminism to feed into it, that we need separate struggles, that we don't, or that um, socialism is in some sense reductionist and reduces everything to the class struggle. So I'll end with a quote from the book from Inessa Armand. The highest law of a communist economy is to meet the material and cultural needs of all members of society, measured against the highest, most advanced productive and cultural possibilities of the time. It can be achieved only in a social organism that recognises the equal worth of all socially necessary and useful labour and values the effort and authority of motherhood as a social task and that bases the condition of development of its members from birth on free social labour and the highest conscious effort. There's nothing reductionist about this vision of socialism. It's all about fulfilling human liberation. Thank you so much, Judy. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. So, yes. So thank you to all of the panel for your presentations. I found them very thought provoking and um, it's kind of unfortunate for me that I'm a moderator and not a panelist because I do have quite a lot to say and I will try and say a little bit if that's possible. I would like to ask everybody who's watching to please um if you want to make a question or a short contribution, if you just could please put it in the chat box and we will try to answer it as best as we can. Um, also, of course, um, the book will be available, is available um, to purchase now from Haymarket. And I would really urge you to go and get it. For me, as somebody who's been in the communist movement for decades and who used to wonder what exactly happened with the women's question in the Soviet Union? This book and well, my own research on the Genotel and getting their their journal Communistka for the first time and managing to learn enough Russian to read it was like finding buried treasure. But this was like more, was like digging deeper and expanding that find. And I think that there's special credit due to Daria for rooting out the document on the second conference in 1921, because I think that that has brought us so much food for thought. Um, and what I like particularly, as other people have mentioned, is that there is real debate going on. Um, that it, this is not just people getting up and agreeing with each other. There's no shadow boxing. Things are said directly. And um, as others have mentioned, I mean, even, you know, Clara Zetkin, who would have been, you know, seen as she was the most important person, she would have been deeply respected. And given her age and experience, it would have been difficult to take her on. But the German women did take her on over the March action. Um, over the the activities, the ultra leftism of the of Comintern, and I think that that's very interesting because it wasn't about the women's conference as such in terms of the strict questions, um, that connected to it, and, and Zetkin tried to rule it out of order and not allow it to be discussed, but they still went ahead. So, in the spirit of controversy, I would like to uh, now introduce um. A, well, a couple of questions, and one of them to preface to say that I do have a difference um, with Brigitte in terms of this question of feminism, um, because besides the, besides the sort of laterally kind of affixating that title onto people who um, rejected it, which I can kind of understand the argument for that, do you think, and this is a question really um, for you all, uh, it is certainly the case that the, the Genotiel was the leading force in inspiring and setting up 
the formation of the communist women's movement. It didn't come out of nowhere, of course. We had the previous socialist women's conferences and we also had Clara Zetkin, who, if you like, was the continuity. But nevertheless, I would say that they believed that they were in a new situation where feminism was no longer, you know, in Russia and Soviet Union's feminism as a movement, as the bourgeois movement that they described it as, that they had opposed, that no longer existed, really. And now it was their turn, their kind of post-feminist turn to create this new society. And they were extremely enthusiastic. And, you know, you can read how they talk in their own memoirs about, you know, running everywhere and becoming exhausted because they tried to do so much, including building this world movement. So I would ask you, I suppose, your view on that question and also how you think it it coming on the heels of this revolution and coming on the heels of an organization which believed that it was building a new society, how you think that that affected the debates um, in those first two years? So perhaps I'll I'll start with Daria and then and then move to whoever else wants to comment on the question. Certainly, hopefully you all will will want to, um, as you know, perhaps. In the meantime, other people will come forward with questions, but if not, um, I've plenty more. <laughs> so, Daria, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. I think there were a few questions there. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I actually see the communist women's movement as both uh, based a lot on the theory and practice developed by the Genodel, and inspired by the activities of the Genodel, but also uh, by the Soviet legislation and Soviet policies, which were in their turn um, uh, to, to, to an important degree developed by women of the Genodel, by uh, Kolontai, Armand, and, uh, and the others. Uh, but at the same time, I can clearly see uh, the legacy of the Second International, and um, I think this debate, which uh, indeed happens at the Second Conference when um, uh, German activists, but also uh, some others who were part of the Second International, and uh, Clara Zetkin, who was part of the Second International as well, uh, are saying, well, look, this uh, women's movement uh, existed before, you know, and we have to uh, recognize. So I think um, the communist women's movement was really the combination of the two, uh, largely also due to uh, the leadership, right, from which uh, was uh, associated with both the um, Second International, well, what, what used to be Second International before the war, and uh, uh, the Genodel. Um Uh, but yes, uh, yes. So once once again, uh, the presence of Kolontai, who was uh, uh, the driving force of the Genozel uh, in the leadership of the International Women's Secretariat, Kolontai was actually the assistant secretary of the International Women's Secretariat, was um, was something that really linked uh, the Genozel to the uh, communist women's movement. Um, I think also, um, and here we, I, I'm not sure, I, I, I think here we also might disagree with uh, Bridget, but maybe I, I got it wrong. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think what was also uh, the practice, um, which was characteristic of the uh, Genodel and the relationship between uh, the Genodel and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was kind of brought into the Communist Women's Movement, meaning the um, the close link with the Comintern, right? Because um, basically uh, the Bolsheviks, but also the Russian uh, Social Democratic Labour Party, even before the split, was against um, separate women's organizing, right? Um, so uh, 
Emancipation has always been on Bolsheviks' agenda, but women had to work together with men within the party to bring about socialist transformation and women's emancipation as a uh, as an inevitable consequence, right, of the uh, revolutionary transformation. Um, so this kind of cooperation uh, of parties and women's department and cooperation of the Comintern and the communist women's movement was also something um, characteristics uh, characteristic of the Genodel because Genodel was was the, the was a department of the communist party right it wasn't a separate organization um yeah then yeah I guess I mentioned the uh um I think uh the important contribution of um uh, Theoretic, uh, or the important contribution of um, genocidal practice and thinking and theories uh, was, first of all, the idea um, about the um, uh, the transformation of housework into social industry, and this is something which was uh, promoted a lot by Kolontai. She has written a lot about that. And by the way, this was something which did not exist in the program of the Second International, of the women's uh, organization within the uh, Second International. This was really something new, right? Something um, that was formulated in the guidelines in 1920. Uh, and finally, yeah, I'll just finish here because I'm speaking too long, I understand. Yeah, and the whole uh, idea of um, around motherhood, but also reproductive rights, right, the right to abortion, but at the same time, the necessity for the state to take care of mothers and children and provide social aid to mothers and children was also something uh, they did issue, but at least the initiative was there and it was integrated into legislation as well. Yeah. So okay, I guess... thank you, Daria. I, I'm really sorry for no problem. Uh, you up there. It's just we've got we've got two very interesting questions in the chat now as well. And I just like uh, Brigitte, if you'd like to come in now to respond, um, just briefly. Yeah. yeah. Um, the question about um, about feminism. First, one thing. Um, there was an important. Um, dialogue and in mutual influencing between Russian and uh, German activists. And in German, um, in the German language, the, the word feminism did not, um, was not in use. I mean, it did exist, but it really was not a common word used at the time. Neither but what we could call bourgeois feminists, nor, uh, of course, by uh, socialist and communist activists, women activists. But what I'm saying is, um, feminism is for me not a descriptive word because it's not used by the actors of the time. But for me, it's an analytical term because it um, shows what uh, these women wanted to do, namely fight for women's equality and women's rights. And so there is this uh, similarity between bourgeois feminism and communist uh, activists. So um, I think it's, it's, it, you can speak about feminism for both. This is, this is one thing. Now the question of the influence of the Genotel on, on the communist women's movement. Um, I think there is some, it's quite, in a certain way, it's a little bit ambiguous. Because for one thing, um, it was the first time, I think, in history that women's equality was state-backed. That is, the Genotiel was a state-backed organization which had a lot of influence and could put forward ideas in, in the early Soviet Union. But then, the, 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 if you look at the history, how it developed, and this is, of course, something which is um, conjectural, depending on 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 the context, um, this dependency of international communism, and it's also true for the international communist movement on the Soviet Union, 
became uh, after a certain time not only helpful. I mean, it was helpful, of course, financially, but it was also helpful at the beginning because um, the Soviet Union provided much of the infrastructure of the ideas of um, uh, the, the, the personal, but it also became a burden after a certain while because uh, on the financial side, um, on the programmatic side and ideologically. So actually it is it is ambiguous. And of course, um, we are speaking here about the first two or three years of this women's movement, where we can see there is still this, um, uh, how to say this, this whole panel of ideas and uh, um, uh, different uh, 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 views and contradictions and certain pluralism in, in political views. But then with the time, uh, particularly with 1924, you have uh, the premise of socialism in one country, and this became somehow um, part of the mental map of, of all communists in, in the world. The, the alignment with the Soviet Union became so important, even sometimes to dominate their own interests. Um, it, it is also, uh, of course, a product of the flowing back of the revolutionary tide in, in Western Europe, particularly in Germany. So it's not something which it was teleological that is given from the beginning, but it is really a historical process. But um, some of the ambiguity is that um, the international communist movement was dependent on um, the Soviet Union, the backing of the Soviet Union. Um, we don't hear you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brigitte. Um, I'm just going to ask Mike and then Judy, if that's okay, to comment. And then I have a number of questions in the chat to go back to. So, um, Okay, well, I, I want to take up uh, the, this discussion on, on the question of feminism. Um, I know there's a long tradition in the socialist movement of always wanting to um, address questions of terminology in black and white terms. But in this case, I, I think it is a bit more complex. Um, you know, as has been pointed out, the, the members of the uh, communist women's movement and communists at the time most definitely did not refer to themselves themselves as feminists. Um, it's important to keep in mind the majority of feminist groups at the time, although not all of them, consisted of um, largely, I would say, of you know upper or middle class women who were not particularly sympathetic to the struggles of working people, um, and you know I, I think their um, this perspective it's the the term bourgeois feminism in this case I think was was actually was accurate. Um, and women's rights fighters with a different perspective, like Sylvia Pankhurst, Ida B. Wells, um, tended to be marginalized, uh, you know, within the movement. But, but there's another side to this question, which is, um, you know, as, as you can see in the book, there were many communists, male communists in particular, that didn't, that certainly didn't want much to do with feminists and women's rights advocates, uh, which they which they thought the issue, they tended to see the issue as diversionary from the broader you know, working class struggle. And you, you see in the book that um, the, some, some of these, these women communists began to term what they termed anti-feminism. Uh, that is the, uh, uh, th this, a negative view of many male, you know, male, many male communists towards the struggle for women, women's rights, and and I mean, this was actually something that had taken place that Kolontai and Armand encountered in the Bolshevik Party too, in the you know, in the years before the revolution. That is, any demand for women's rights was sometimes just labeled as feminism and rejected um, offhand, reflecting the backward views and prejudices that these men had. So I, I think that you ha in that uh, this this question has to be viewed historically, and it's not necessarily from the, with the same prism as we do uh, today in terms of how the uh, you know how the term has come to be uh, 
has come to be viewed and used. Thanks, Mike. Judy? Yes, thank you. I read your PhD on the Zenit Dalan, and that's also full of buried treasures, just to throw that into the mix. I think, as Mike said, the idea that, I think it was Rebecca West, actually, who said that every time I distinguish myself from a doormat, I'm called a feminist. And you do get that sense in the book that it was quite easy for men to say, oh, you're divisive, you're raising trivial issues, you're going to split the movement, you're really feminist. Um, but I think feminism has to mean more than simply paying attention to women's rights. I think um, but both Zetkin in Germany and Kolontai in Russia were deeply critical of the women's suffrage movement, the leadership of it, the bourgeois nature of it, while at the same time fighting very hard for women, working class women to get the vote to mobilise men in that campaign. Zetkin talked about how in the suffrage uh, demos in Germany, the women would go in their carriages to, to protest. And Kalantai talked about the um, sort of, uh, what's the word, hyper-optimistic idea of uniting ladies with their maids to fight for the vote. So they were on the side of women's rights, but deeply critical of the bourgeois women who sought to derail those movements. Um, and of course, the women's movements, the feminist movements split over things like the First World War. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst was in Petrograd in 1917, arguing with Kerensky to keep the, Russia in the war and to keep the war going. Well, Sylvia was back home in the East End arguing to um, stop the war and build a communist society. So for me, feminism implies that there are two separate struggles, one against capitalism, one against patriarchy, and therefore we have to organise on that basis. I reject that. And personally, I believe like the uh, early communist women, that socialist feminism does uh, imply challenging sexism wherever it arises and creating the conditions of a different kind of society in which women's liberation has to be central. Okay, thank you all. That was uh, very interesting. And um, I'll have to think a bit more about this question of feminism because for me, um, for me, and I just say this very briefly, um, Sometimes I worry that that we haven't really properly understood how to integrate the woman's question with Marxism or with communism, and that uh, with them um, with saying it's feminism or it's not that that we can kind of uh, miss out that opportunity. But in any event, it's it's an ongoing discussion, and I think that this book has given us something to really look at in terms of the experiences that were being discussed at the time. Anyway, enough from me. Um, uh, thank uh, you very much. Can I say something? Excuse me. But of course. I, yeah. Your, uh, a different understanding of feminism. I, I, I think uh, there is not one feminism. There are different sorts of feminisms and um, differences between different sorts of feminism or just, something which have to be taken into account and which were there. Um, so uh, feminism in my conception is something which is very, um, uh, it, 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 it's an analytical concept and it's not just describing one particular strand of women's activism. Okay, thank you very much. So I have four questions now in the chat from our audience. And thank you very much for putting these um, important questions in there. Um, sorry, I've just seen that Daria's got her hand up. Perhaps I can read out the questions and then when she comes back in, she can begin uh, to look at these as well. The first question is, ah, very appropriately, what is the analytical meaning of feminism in the speaker's view? So I'll take Daria and then come back to you, Brigitte, on that, I think. Um, then the next question is, can you talk more about the theoretical contributions about the source of women's oppression that were discussed at these meetings? What were the specific demands that came from those discussions? I think that 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 kind of ties into that as well, doesn't it? What were the sources of the theory? If you're saying that, you know, it was or wasn't feminist, what were they looking at? What was what were what were they guiding themselves with? Um, and then, um, and then, okay, ah, oh, um, 
I have um, three more questions. Um, a question. Okay, sorry about this. Now I'm just trying to connect things up together a little bit before I come back to you. Okay, so I'm going to take Barbara Allen and then I'm going to take the next two questions afterwards. Um, the uh, Barbara asks, what kind of conflicts and tensions existed among women communists in 1920, 22 about how to promote women's needs and interests? Um, so I think, yes, because the other two questions are about Central Asia and the trade union movement. And I think, hopefully, sorry about this, I'm just trying to understand. Okay, okay. So I'll, so if I could ask the panellists to, uh, you know, obviously, you're not going to be able to answer every single thing that you'd like to say in five minutes. But if you could just give five minutes attention to these three questions and then I'll take the other two and we'll come back okay so Dar Daria I'll take you first and then uh, Brigitte and then Judy yeah I'll just say what I have to say very quickly it's uh, on the question of feminism uh, indeed there is a big discussion on this uh, at the second conference uh, and although, although uh, the final resolution uh, instructed communist women not to seek unity with bourgeois feminists, there was a debate and uh, that shows that many communist women were genuinely, genuinely supportive of such cooperation. And it did happen on the ground. And that's something you can clearly see from our section on the communist women's movement around the world. Um, so, yeah, and uh, actually... From some of my other research, uh, I found a lot of collaboration of uh, communists with uh, non-proletarian women and sometimes including uh, liberal feminists on different issues, especially reproductive rights, motherhood questions, et cetera, et cetera, um, in, in Europe and beyond. Yeah. Uh, Daria, do you want to go on and, and deal with these three questions? Because they're... Um... About yeah. the theory, about the theory. Um, yeah, I could, I yeah, I could probably add to the uh, theoretical contributions about the source of women's suppression. Um, so, yeah, uh, communist women spoke about the double oppression, and well, you know, Lenin spoke about that, and many others as well, uh, by both the capitalist system, but also at home. Uh, and I think that um, the um, sort of uh, uh, demands that were uh, formulated out of that uh, were that of the uh, transformation of housework into social industry uh, and all kinds of aid to uh, mothers and children. So that's my short answer. Thank you, Brigitte. Um, yeah, about the first question, uh, an analytical, I think I've answered this before, I hope uh, this is okay. Um, about um, the theoretical contributions and the basis of um, the communist women's analysis, I, I mean, they were Marxists and they all had read, uh, and er very often early socialists, and they had read Babel, they had read Engels. And uh, as Daria said, I mean, they were starting from the idea that women had a double burden uh, not just in, 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 in the public life and labor, so, but also in the housework, and this should be socialized. So um, this the, the, the most, I think, the main strand of uh, theoretical thinking. But um, the, the um, communist women added new ideas, and in particular, of course, uh, Colin Chai with her reflection on, on sexuality and uh, the domination of uh, uh, men in the couple, in the family. Um, uh, all these reflections were very, very important, um, but they did not meet general agreement in the communist movement. I mean, uh, I think uh, Mike Tara said it, that there were many men who did not work on themselves to change their attitude towards women. And this was a big problem um, for women in the relationships, in the movement. And of course, later on, with the um, turn to more 
conservative views in the Soviet Union, in the communist movement, um, women's demand for equality on the private and intimate level, which were touching on the identity of the male comrades, they were, I think, mainly pushed away. This does not uh, preclude that many communist women did um, uh, use and demand for themselves uh, a free life and equality and free sexuality. There are many uh, memoirs and autobiographies where women say how much um, they had this conception that communism was also for themselves um, uh, 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 the, the, the right to, to, have, to, li to live uh, free sexuality and uh, open relationships. But of course, this was not mainstream. Thank you. Judy, would you like to come in? Yeah, just on the theoretical legacy, um, Brigitte's touched absolutely August Babel, Engels. I think the important thing about Engels is the um, rise of the family private property in the state indicates that women's oppression is the oldest oppression and the most deeply rooted oppression. And despite all these dramatic changes and despite the progressive legislative policy of the Bolshevik party, um, it was inevitable really that ideas would, were not going to be uprooted overnight, particularly in the context of fighting uh, the civil war and the material deprivation. But nevertheless, um, Fritzschaya wrote an important pamphlet, The Woman Worker, which was um, published in 1905. Alexandra Kollontai's people have said, Inessa Arman's uh, Communista, which was her attempt to raise more theoretical questions. And actually, at times, she talks about the triple oppression, where woman is the slave of man, um, the, the burden of uh, working outside of the home, and the burden of domestic labour inside the home. Um, so there's all kinds of uh, developments going on here. A lot of these ideas were incorporated in the Second International. The problem was the Second International uh, we've touched on already was a question of theory and practice. It's all right to have great theory, but are you going to uh, encourage, instigate and sustain practice? So I think the theoretical legacy was that women would only be liberated if they could be freed from the domestic drudgery of the house work. And that goes right back to the uh, early socialists of the early 19th century. How can you replace the family? Uh, you need serious material resources to give us the chance for a different life to living our lives in multiple ways, however we choose, uh, without um, getting rid of the privatised family. Um, in terms of the tensions Barbara asked, I think so, the book, um, the volume makes clear that some of the tensions were about women's issues and some of the tensions were general political tensions. So there were fierce debates about abortion because um, many working class women were worried about eugenics, worried that uh, abortion rights would be used to undermine childcare and their fight for maternity provision because it was only the Bolsheviks that brought in uh, decent maternity leave in Russia and those sort of questions. There were also political arguments about the vote. If you fight for the vote, are you not going to mislead women to go back to looking to parliament to change instead of to their own self-emancipation? Um, which was defeated because of the fight for equal rights was seen as more important. But the question of the uh, March action um, and the United Front were all very uh, important, tense questions. The fact that they exist, I think, gives the myth to this kind of Stalinist monolith existing um, in the early 1920s and shows that for all the tensions, there was a vibrant, um, joyful and humorous women's movement, which was dedicated to spreading the revolution globally and ensuring its ultimate success. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, Mike, do you want to come in? Um, well, I, I think that one of the things that readers will uh, really appreciate when they go through the book is um, it, it, the, the way it took up the, these, the, the big theoretical political questions, but they did it from the, you know, from the standpoint of how to Concretize it based on, on the one hand, of the experience of the, of the Russian Revolution, Jean Hotel, and actually trying to put these many of these things into practice, as well as the 
uh, the beginning of a movement that's trying to figure out how to take these issues and how to fight for them. And you see uh, some, some very interesting um, both debates and you know different you know various differences in uh, shade shadings and, and approaches toward these different things. Some of them extremely interesting. There's a in the book. There's actually a little bit of an exchange between Zetkin and Kolontai on the question of the role of housewives in the movement and the extent to which uh, the communist women movement needed to prioritize work among uh, women workers. Now, th there was essential agreement on all kinds of questions, but you can see the different the different emphases that um, uh, you know that these that these leaders placed on these on these questions. Uh, there was also the um, uh, Zetkin gave a report on the question of women's suffrage that that really that that took that actually. Uh, she, she she was clearly fighting. You know, a lot of communists at that time uh, uh, looked on very negatively to what they were what they called partial struggles. That is, things that that if you weren't fighting for the dictatorship of the proletariat now, that um, it you know it um, this was an obstacle. Um, so she you know Zetkin's trying. She, her, her basic point is that the communists should throw themselves into into this fight at the same while well, they, they maintain their uh, um, you know who who they were and their perspective, but you you see different uh, uh, different approaches by by the various delegates on um, on. Uh, on that and various attacks on Zetkin. And then in her summary, Zetkin says, well, I, I'm wondering whether people even are referring to what I was, uh, what I what I believe or so forth. So it, it's actually really interesting. I think um, as, as people read the book, uh, the, these things bring some of the, the, the theoretical questions that they're, uh, with, with, I mean, there, there weren't vast theoretical debates at these Congress, but there were these underpinnings of uh, of the Marxist view and how to put them, how to put it into practice. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much uh, to the questioners, to A. James Green, uh, Diane Feely, and to Barbara, to Barbara Allen for those questions. Um, I, I know, Brigitte, uh, you want to come in. What I'm going to do a little bit like I did the last time, is I have two uh, final questions. So I'm going to read them out. I'm going to bring you in first and you can deal with whatever you want to deal with from the last uh, round and then move on to these questions. So the first one is from Balahar Sangera. And their question is, currently decolonization dis discourses in Central Asia criticize Soviet policy on women in the region. What do the panelists think of that? Um, and the second question is from Linda Leo, and her question is, are there any further comments about the relationship between the communist women's movement and the trade union, and trade union work? It seems that there would be significant relationship to workplace issues and they're both fantastic questions so what i want to ask the panelists to do is to uh, start with brigitte um to answer these questions as well as anything else you want to say in summing up um and we'll bring this uh, discussion to a conclusion for tonight but hopefully we'll be able to continue it on because i think we've actually got so much here already that needs further development so, uh, so firstly, uh, Brigitte. Um, yes, just uh, I wanted to add a comment uh, about um, the importance of uh, communism uh, and communist organizations for women, because there was one point we haven't touched upon. We have been speaking about the, the programmatic uh, progressiveness of uh, communism, but um, as an organization, um, the Comintern and communist organizations were for women at that time also a very rare opportunity and a space for political activity, which um, they did not have in most other 
um, political countries, uh, uh, countries, uh, political parties, and and countries. Um, yes. Uh, the questions. Uh, I'm 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 not sure. Um, I can ask the question about. Uh, uh, the the policy on women in 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 uh, Central Asia, um, of course there was. I mean, at that time, what uh, the communists wanted to do was to free women from um, religious and patriarchal oppression, and this was also liberating them from the the wheel, uh, liberating them from. Um, the the the, um, uh, the housework liberating them, letting them be openly in the public space. Uh, of course, this was something which was very contrary to, for, for the understanding of many people in the region. Now um, there were many women who agreed with this, and um, of course there is a debate. Now I don't know really what this questions is aiming at, if it's uh, meaning that today with uh, the, the, more, uh, the, the more presence of Islamic thinking and its traditional views on women, there is a contradiction to Soviet policy. Don't know. Um, about the question of um, women and trade union work, I think this is a really interesting question. And this is a question which needs uh, would need a lot of more research because there is um, one um, aspect of communist activity, uh, trade union activities, the Trade Union International, which uh, is uh, uh, has been worked upon. The research is uh, not very gender uh, uh, interested, and uh, there is some research going on. But I think it's of course a very very important question. The the the, the trade union policy was discussed in commentary and at the early congresses, but there was a lot of different different opinions. If the trade union socialist or reformist trade unions were considered as important places for communists to be active. And um, Lenin and the Bolshevik leaders, they were pushing this, that it is important to be inside the, the, the existing trade unions, um, where women were, of course, in a minority, but um, this is another question. But then the Comintern changed its, its orientation in, in, in the end of the 1920s. And tried to, in the second part of the 1920s, and tried to create their own trade union. So it's it's a really important, but it's a complicated question, um, which would need a lot of more research, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Bridget. Um I'm going to ask Judy now, and then Mike and Daria to finish off. Okay, thank you again. <clears throat> important questions I don't think we've got time to delve into too much I just wanted to say um in terms of the policy um of women of the east uh, it depends which Soviet policy you mean <laughs> because you have early Soviet policy where you have uh, Lenin um, and the Bolsheviks attempting to uh deconstruct to um to tear down what he called the Tsarist prison house of nations um, Lenin talks about the festival of the oppressed, meaning the Polish language that in the 1905 revolution, lots of people who were um, oppressed by Russia, who were uh, colonialized by Russia, found their voices and so on. And um, you get a very different picture if you're talking about Soviet policy under Stalin after the defeat of the German revolution, after Stalin's counter revolution, after the murder of thousands of old Bolsheviks, including many of the leading um, women inside Russia, where you get abortion recriminalized, despite Trotsky's best efforts to stop it in 1936, I think. And then you get the Comintern being, um, became, becoming a tool of Stalinist foreign policy. And I think, Anne, you, your research suggests how the Zenit Dal was undermined by that Stalinism, that, that in the early days, women had gone out veiled, they'd gone out to um, 
try and reach women of the East in creative ways that wouldn't offend, wouldn't upset, but would reach for healthcare, for education. And then under Stalin, it became a confrontational tear off the bales um, and so on. And therefore, all that sort of goodwill and those relationships were lost. So I think the early uh, Soviet policy was very progressive in terms of the East, the Stalinist, of course, not so. Um, women in the trade union movement, there were huge obstacles to women joining the trade union movement. Some uh, trade union movements were incredibly chauvinist um, and many women were uh, brought in just before and during the First World War because men were not there and took part in munition strikes and various, but permanent uh, organisation was a big um, a big obstacle, a big battle, and of course there were huge debates about red trade unions, whether people should just leave the reactionary old trade unions behind and set up their own, but of course the United Front strategy meant that Bolsheviks and communists should stay in their trade unions and organise with the mass of workers, but huge questions. So just to sum up, I want to say thank you so much to Daria and Mike for the book and to Anne for sharing, and to me the message of the evening is that uh, we can look forward and we can believe and have confidence and hope in the capacity of working class women and men to struggle and resist a system of equality and injustice, that emancipation will come from struggle from below and that women kicked it off in 1917 on International Women's Day. Women sustained it and women will always be an absolutely central part of any socialist programme. OK, thank you very much, Judy. Thank you so much. And Mike? Would you like to? Um, well, well on, on the question of uh, Soviet policy in the East, uh, if I could, I'd like to plug Anne's uh, PhD thesis, which actually is, is very interesting. And I know she's working on turning that into a book, but actually there's a lot of information there in terms of the 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 evolution of, of Soviet policy on many questions such as um, 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 on the question of trade unions, I'll, um, there w wasn't a lot of discussion at the um, at the Communist Women's Movement conferences on, on the question. Um, I, I will the 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 next volume in the in our series on on the Comintern Publishing Project is going to be on the. Um, Proceedings and Resolutions of the Founding uh, Congress of the Red International Labor Unions in 1921. And th at that meeting, there actually was quite a bit of discussion on, on the question of, of the, the relationship of women and the trade unions, um, which, uh, you, know, you know, hopefully people will have a chance to see that before too long. Um, the, the one, actually, there was an, a very, in the section of the book on the, uh, Communist Women's Movement and around the world. There's actually a, a very an interesting in the uh, reports from Germany. There's uh, some interesting, uh, clearly some interesting debate uh, within the communist movement in Germany about what to do with about of the discriminatory layoffs of women that that is taking place in Germany at you know following the end of the uh, of the first you know in the years following the First World War and how ex and clearly there were differences within the movement on how to uh, how to take that up and, and a li little it's it. You can read a little bit into it, the uh, disagreements basically between the women's department and other sections of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, male communists within, uh, functioning within the trade unions. Uh, but that, that is an interesting um, uh, point that clearly uh, could, there's, there's more investigation that, that would be helpful. Uh, finally, uh, I just encourage people to, uh, to read the book and delve into it. And uh, there's many different sides that, to get out of it. There's many uh, different perspectives, um, that, uh, different ways of analyzing, you know, the questions, some of which we've discussed here tonight, today, tonight. Um, but uh, I, I think it, people will, will not be disappointed by uh, uh, taking this up. And uh, finally, Daria. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for, for the questions and the discussion. Uh, yeah, I think the first question was answered and I also encourage everybody to read uh, Anne's um, thesis and future book. Um, on trade union movement, um, it, it, well, the importance of uh, women's participation in trade unions is uh, mentioned in almost uh, every conference and uh, meeting of communist women. Um, again, yeah, those uh, discriminatory uh, layoffs and politics of trade unions are also uh, uh, tackled and criticized. Um, Mike, in his book on the prof intern on the Red International of Labor Unions, has this resolution uh, passed by the prof intern on the involvement of women in trade union work. Um, I actually wrote uh, a chapter about this uh, for those who are uh, interested uh, on uh, basically um, um, uh, participation of women uh, in the prof intern and how the communist women's movement um, was involved. Uh, it has just been published by Brill in the series Studies in Global Socialist Hi Social History. Uh, and it's called, the volume is called uh, Through the Prism of Gender and Work. Uh, so there is a chapter on, on uh, um how uh well basically uh the co uh, communist women took up that resolution of the prof intern seriously <laughs> and started organizing women within the prof intern and uh had a number of groups there they had different names at different times um and i also look at uh how this worked out uh in um in a few countries um, around Europe, uh, namely Poland, Austria, uh, and some others. Uh, yeah, so that's what I had to say about the uh, trade uh, union question. But otherwise, uh, together with Mike, I encourage everybody to read the book because um, yeah, that, that's that's how you you will understand how it was, how it worked, uh, and it's yeah, it's just fascinating reading, as <laughs> as Bridget said earlier, um, and and very inspiring as well for for the struggles today, which unfortunately, uh, one hundred years later. Uh, oftentimes remain the same if we think of uh, abortion issue, uh, affordable daycare issue. Um, these are the same problems that women still grapple with around the world. So um, hence uh, importance of going back to the roots, uh, to the sources uh, and the radical thoughts. They, the first basically uh, radical uh, theorization of these issues in the early 20s. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daria. Oh, sorry, uh, Bridget, did you want to say something? Did That's you want just, to comment? Uh, just to, to, to comment and a uh, final comment. I think this is really an important book, book because it, it shows uh, these pioneering women and uh, how they elaborated a program that became a, um, uh, a blueprint for later feminism, uh, even if there were also some blind spots. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you to all four of you and to the participants in the audience who've asked such challenging questions. I'm sorry about the noise in the background there. Um, but uh, just to finally um, read the question from A. James Green. I'm sorry, I, we don't have time to deal with this question, but I think it's kind of more of a, a thinking about thing, a kind of reflective thought that we can leave here with rather than something that we have to immediately answer. So he says the left opposition stated that it stood on the first four congresses of Comintern, but these conferences were not referred to thoughts. And I suppose I would just say exactly. This is something that's been missing from our history. And I think that when we look at it and look at these conferences, we have to reevaluate our history. We have to incorporate this movement into our history and 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 there and that is 
a challenging and interesting task. So again, thanks to you all uh, for taking part in this debate. For me, it's been extremely stimulating and I've uh, really enjoyed presenting it. Um, thank you to Brill, to Historical Materialism and to Haymarket for sponsoring this event. And hopefully this debate will continue. Thank you very much.